Okay, Zhu from Sunny Albany and Shanto University is going to talk about Saracen Hub Blitz product problem. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the organizers for uh, organizing such a nice uh, focus program and also for inviting me to give this talk. Um, but I guess I, I, I need to apologize uh, beforehand that <laughs> uh, my talk over here is not really about the duration of space. Uh, although the focus this week is supposed to be uh, about the duration of space. Uh, but I, I suppose most people in the audience will already know the spaces I want to talk about. Uh, I will be talking about uh, operators on the uh, holiday space, the Bergman space, and also uh, on the uh, Fox space. <clears throat> okay, so most specifically, I want to talk about uh, Cyrus's Topolis product problem uh, this is a problem that has been around for many years. Uh, I got involved in this uh, about uh, starting from about 10 years ago. Uh, the initial problem uh, you'll see later is about uh, Tobolis operators on the Hardy space and the Bergman space, but clearly the problem makes sense for the Fox space. So my starting point over here will be the uh, uh, spaces I want to uh, define my uh, operators on. Um, I will introduce uh, three uh, function spaces. Um, now, Jared, when, when somebody enters the uh, meeting, do you admit or I admit them? Do not worry about them. We let okay. them. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. I will, uh, I will need three spaces. Uh, the first space will live on the unit circle. Uh, the second space lives on the unit disk, and then the uh, third space will be on the complex plane. Uh, I think those three settings are the most convenient uh, to do uh, complex analysis or harmonic analysis. Um, uh, so the, uh, I'll start with the uh, holy space. So the space will live on the unit circle T. Uh, there are many different ways to define the holy space uh, in terms of the Fourier coefficients. Uh, the space, the Hardy space will be uh, the space of analytic functions uh, or the space of functions uh, in L2 of the circle where the negative Fourier coefficients will be zero. Uh, and then the uh, Bergman space uh, lives on the unit disk. Uh, I'll use A2 to denote the Bergman space, although the notation over here is definitely not uh, unique. Um, so the definition of the Bergman space is that uh, it's the intersection of the usual L2 with respect to area measure or uh, intersection with the space of all analytic functions on the disk. And so those two spaces are very classical. Many people know them. And then the other space I want to talk about will be called the Fox space. Uh, notation will be F2. Uh, even the term Fox space uh, is not exactly, uh, again, unique. Many people will have different names for the space. Uh, but for my talk over here, I'll call this space over here the Fox space. Uh, it's a space of entire functions uh, on the complex plane. Uh, the measure I want to use over here is the Gaussian measure. Okay, again, the A is the area measure. Uh, you use the uh, weight function, the Gaussian weight, weight. And so this is called the Gaussian measure. It's a very small measure. Okay, when you when z goes to infinity, this weight function goes to zero very quickly. Um, and the one over pi, of course, is the normalizing constant. So you look at the L2 space of the complex plane with respect to the Gaussian measure, and then you take the intersection uh, with the space of the entire functions, and then the result is the Fox space. All right. Now, in each one of the three cases over here, uh, you have a uh, uh, L2 space, a big L2 space, uh, L2 of the circle, L2 of the disk, and L2 of the plane. And then you have an analytic subspace inside the L2. And therefore, you're going to have an orthogonal projection, which I denote by P. And now, every time you have a, say, a bounded function phi, again, on the circle, on the disk, on the plane, uh, depending on the uh, setting, uh, then you can define what is called a topless operator on the analytic subspace H. And it's simply multiplication followed by the projection. 
Okay, so if it's from the analytic subspace and you multiply it by a say a bounded function, what you get is still an AO2 function. You project back to the analytic subspace, and therefore the total of all operator will be mapping H back to itself. And you can also define a, a what is called a Hankel operator. So it's uh, still multiplication followed by a projection, but this time the projection is not onto the analytic subspace, or uh, instead is projecting back to the uh, complement of the uh, analytic subspace, we use I minus P. And so TF is called the Toplitz operator, and then HF is the Hankel operator. And for people in this business, uh, when you study the Toplitz operator, the Hankel or operator always comes along and vice versa. Uh, and so people used to call the two together uh, as a uh, uh, Hopley's operator, Hanko and Toplitz. Okay. Now, a very important tool to study the Toplitz and Hanko operators will be the um, integral representation for the orthogonal projection. In each of the three cases, P is actually an integral operator and the integral kernel, you can actually write them down. Uh, in the case of the uh, hardest space, the integral kernel is going to be the Ziegel kernel or the Cauchy kernel. And in the, in the case of the Bergman space, of course, what you get is the Bergman kernel. And in the case of the Fox space, the kernel is going to be the, uh, it's, it's going to be a uh, linear exponential function. Okay. So uh, once again, in each case, the orthogonal projection is going to be an integral operator. You can write integral kernels down. Uh, one advantage of thinking about the orthogonal projection in terms of the integral representation is that uh, it allows you to extend the domain of the projection P to a larger space. Because in the original context, P is only defined on L2. But now if you use the integral representation for P, then the domain of P can be naturally extended. And after you extend the domain of P to a larger space, then you can actually define Toplitz and Hankel operators for functions phi uh, that are not necessarily bounded. Okay. Um, so I mean, and, and once you define Toplitz and Hankel operators for unbounded functions, then you can uh, ask more general questions about, for example, uh, what unbounded functions phi will induce bounded Toplitz operators and so on. Uh, but in each of the three cases, it's easy to uh, show that you can actually have unbounded functions phi and xi such that the Toplitz product is a bounded operator. Um, so, uh, Sarison's initial problem uh, is this. He wanted to characterize all analytic functions phi and xi uh, on the unit circle or the unit disk such that this particular a uh, topless product is a bounded operator, okay? Uh, so the left side, you have an analytic uh, multiplication. On the right-hand side, is a conjugate analytic uh, multiplication. He wanted this particular product to be uh, bounded. Notice that the order of multiplication is important. If you switch the order of multiplication, the problem becomes much, much different. Uh, it, it is this particular combination of the product that makes the problem uh, interesting. Um, you can actually find Saracen's original problem in uh, a uh, Springer lecture notes book. It's a, actually a, pro a problem book. Um, I find this a very interesting book. Uh, I mean, for for the for example, for the uh, graduate students in the audience or the young young analysts, uh, this is actually a very convenient book to have in hand. Uh, oftentimes, you are looking for particular problems. Uh, the, there are actually several different versions of the book. So the initial version has like 199 problems, and then later versions, uh, the, the problem sets uh, were expanded. Uh, anyway, so in, the, the, in the, or the first edition of this book, you can find Saracen's uh, Toplitz product problem. Uh, although initially Saracen only asked the problem for the hardest base and the Bergman base, obviously the problem also makes sense for the Fox base. Uh, so for the Fox base, you will be asking for uh, entire functions phi and xi such that this particular Toplitz product uh, is bounded. Okay. Now, when Saracen initially uh, 
proposed the problem, he also made a conjecture. Um, and his conjecture, again, in that uh, uh, Sprunger problem book, you can find the conjecture. And his conjecture was that this particular Toplitz product is going to be a bounded operator uh, if and only if this uh, product of two functions is bounded. And the uh, big tilde over here means the so called uh, Burson transform. Uh, this is the notion that has become popular over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Uh, uh, you use the Burson transform to study operator theory. Uh, in particular, it's a very effective tool to study uh, Toplitz operators and Hankel operators. Uh, in the case of the uh, uh, Hardy space, the, the Burson transform is simply the uh, classical uh, Poisson transform. And in the case of the Bergman space and the Fox space, uh, the definition for the Burson transform is similar uh, based on the uh, uh, normalized repeals and kernels. I'm, I'm probably not writing the definition down over here, but again, it's a very standard notion by now. So Sarison also made the conjecture. Uh, this operator is bounded if and only if this function is bounded. Uh, not only he proposed the problem, uh, he also uh, formulated the conjecture and he went one step further. Uh, Sarison also provided one half of the proof for the conjecture, namely the only if part. Uh, he actually showed over there is a, a relatively short proof, a half page proof uh, that uh, for, bo for both the Hardy space and the Bergman space, if this operator is bounded, then this function is definitely bounded. So he, he has a, a very short proof for that direction. Um, the proof is short, but it's not exactly trivial. Uh, you need some very good uh, ways of doing things, uh, but, 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 but it is a short proof. And so the problem, uh, sat over there for several years and then some people started to work on it. Uh, eventually, um, oh, before I, I, I talk about the, the uh, results, I wanna mention that uh, the short proof that Cyrus and Gibbs for the only if part actually does not work for the Fox space. Uh, he needed to use something very specific about the Hardy space and the Bergman space. And if you look carefully, uh, what he used over there is no longer true for the Fox space. So if you look at Cyrus's conjecture for the Fox space, uh, initially both directions are, are not clear. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, once again, after the problem was proposed, uh, several people worked on it. And then uh, in uh, uh, 1997, uh, it was, uh, discovered that uh, Cyrus's conjecture was actually wrong. In other words, one direction is true, but the other direction is false uh, for the for the uh, Hardy space. And its counterexample was constructed by Nazarov in 1997. And then uh, several years later, it was discovered that Cyrus's conjecture was also uh, wrong uh, for the Bergman space. And this time the uh, the counterexample was given by Alleman, Pot, and Rivera in 2013. Uh, so it looks like the problem for the Hardy space and the Bergman space, uh, the conjecture is definitely false. Uh, but of course, the problem is still open. Exactly when this operator is bounded, uh, I want to say right away over here, the problem is still open for the uh, for the Hardy space and for the Bergman space. Uh, the way that those two counterexamples were constructed were based on uh, um, ideas from harmonic analysis. It turns out that Saracen's problem uh, was the equivalent to certain uh, two-weight two estimates for the risk projection in the case of the Hardy space, and also a two-weight estimate for the, Bergman, for the Bergman projection in the case of the Bergman space. And this connection has been uh, known to many people uh, if I remember correctly, the exact connection is this. Um, for example, in the case of the Bergman space, if you want to uh, uh, reformulate Cyrus's problem, then it is the same as considering the action of the Bergman projection from this weighted L2 space to this weighted L2 space. And you want to know whether or not this is still a bounded operator. Uh, and there are similar reformulations for the Hardy space and for the uh, for the Fox space. 
just because you have a reformulation doesn't mean that the problem becomes any easier. Uh, the, it is very known that the two-way estimates for uh, in harmonic analysis is a very uh, classical problem, is not easy. Uh, many people are still working on this problem for different weights. Um, but fortunately, in the case of the Hardy space and the Bergman space, the two-weight problem can be solved in harmonic analysis, and therefore you get like uh, count examples for uh, Sarasen's problems in those two contexts. All right. Uh, but the uh, uh, bottom line is for the Hardy space and the Bergman space, uh, the conjecture is false. Uh, but there are some very interesting uh, partial results I want to mention. Uh, some positive results uh, in connection with the uh, original conjecture. Uh, so initially, Sarasen's conjecture was that you look at this the product of these two functions with a, a exponent two. Uh, one particular partial result I want to mention is that uh, if instead of using two, you use two plus epsilon uh, uh, in the exponent before you take the uh, variance and transform. And it is known that in the case of the Hardy space and the Bergman space, if epsilon is not too small, there's a certain cutoff number, I mean, not exact, we don't really need to know it right now. So there's a certain cutoff number, a positive number, uh, so that if epsilon is bigger than that number, and if this function is bounded, then it turns out the uh, Toplitz product uh, TFTG bar is going to be bounded. So the original conjecture, although it was wrong, it was actually very close. Uh, it, it's, it's, very, it's a very precise uh, formulation of the problem. If you increase the exponent somewhat, then you, then you can actually go back. All right. So this is a very particular partial result I want to mention. Anybody who has worked in this area uh, should have seen something like this before. All right. OK, the situation is much, much different for the Fox space. Uh, the first uh, surprise came in 2014. Uh, I went to a, a conference in Korea. Uh, I remember that's a several complex variable conference. Uh, I was sitting in the, in the audience listening to a talk about several complex variables and in the, uh, uh, after the talk of uh, somebody, a student came up to me because at that time I just wrote a book about the Fox base and a student came up to me asking uh, about uh, Sarasen's problem for the Fox base. And at that time, actually, I did not even know Sarasen's problem. So I asked, I asked the student what the problem is all about. He showed me, uh, it looked very interesting. And so I started looking at this problem. And then a few weeks later, we figured out the whole situation uh, for the Fox base. And it turns out the situation is much different. So uh, here is the first result we obtained in 2014. If you take two entire functions, f and g, uh, to begin with, you wanted the functions to be already in the flux space. Otherwise, the operators will not uh, uh, even be densely defined. So you wanted the functions to be uh, in the flux space already, okay, but definitely not bounded. Uh, on the complex plane, you don't even have any bounded analytic functions uh, other than the constants. Okay. So you, you want to start out with two entire functions in the Fox space. And then we found out that the particular product that we hit that appeared in Saracen's problem is bounded on the Fox space uh, if and only if f is a linear uh, exponential function and a g uh, is more or less the reciprocal of f. Uh, it, it, it could differ by a constant multiple, but the main exponential part is the reciprocal. So we were able to determine exactly when this operator is going to be bounded. And after we have figured this out, then it turns out Cyrus's conjecture is actually true for the Fox space. In other words, for the Fox space, uh, this topless product is bounded if and only if this function is bounded. Uh, it is because in this case, we can actually uh, compute the two cases using the uh, uh, explicit formulas for f and g. So uh, bottom line over here is that <clears throat> Sarasen's conjecture is actually true for the Fox base, and we know a little bit more. We know that if uh, the operator or the function is bounded, then the f and g must be of very uh, uh, specific form. Uh, 
uh, like that. Now, uh, the main reason why Stuyvesant's conjecture is true for the Fox base, or why this, this, this uh, problem can be solved successfully, uh, is based on the, the, the main reason is uh, two, actually two reasons. Uh, it's based on two uh, very classical uh, things in uh, analysis. One is Lovier's theorem that tells us that on the complex plane, there is no non-constant analytic function. Okay, so it's a, you can think of that as a rigidity uh, property for the complex plane, and that makes uh, certain complex analysis on the plane uh, easier. Okay, and then the second ingredient we're going to need is the wild unitary operators, uh, which uh, uh, is a notion that is is probably over a hundred years old. Um, the, the the operators were uh, very classical in mathematical physics. Uh, uh, I'm going to define them for you later. And the, the wild unitary operators are also useful in the uh, representation uh, for the Heisenberg group, which I will mention later. So anyway, the the uh, the main reason why this is possible for the Fox space is because of these two things. All right. Okay, I want to spend a few minutes on the wild operators. And for people who are like not uh, too familiar with this kind of stuff, uh, I realize that most of the audience probably are more comfortable with like the unit disk. Uh, when you study complex analysis on the disk, of course, the Mobius group uh, plays a very important role. And if you do complex analysis on the complex plane, a similar group exists. And th that's the one dimensional Heisenberg group. Uh, for the Mobius group, as I said, you can think of it as like the unit circle times the unit disk. The circle part gives you rotation, and then the disk part gives you uh, what are called symmetries. And the Heisenberg group is similar. As I said, it is the complex plane uh, times the uh, real line. The complex part gives you, uh, gives you translation, and then the real part will also give you a rotation. But the uh, rotation part is not exactly the, uh, uh, when you do the group operation, two rotations together will not give you uh, the obvious uh, uh, rotation corresponding to S plus T. It is adjusted by something that is from the complex part. So over here, it is like a, uh, a twisted rotation. Uh, you don't really have to know much about the Heisenberg group. Just re remember it has like, as I said, it's C cross R and the C corresponds to uh, translation and the R corresponds to a twisted rotation. Um, so very similar to the Mobius group. Okay, again, in the case of the Mobius group, the T, the, the circle corresponds to the EI theta rotation and the D, every point in D gives you what is called a symmetry phi A uh, phi A acting at Z is A minus Z over one minus A bar Z. Uh, I'm sure most people know uh, this kind of uh, 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 representation for the Mobius group. Okay, so I mentioned that for the Heisenberg group, the complex part is uh, translation. Uh, so if you fix an A, I look at this particular uh, translation, Z minus A. Uh, with respect to the area measure, uh, translation, of course, is a uh, non-preserving operation uh, if you use uh, the area measure. But for the Fox space, the measure I use is not the area measure. It's the Gaussian measure. You have a, a certain weight function. In order to make this a uh, unitary, you need to introduce a certain uh, Jacobian. And it turns out, uh, with respect to the Gaussian measure, the Jacobian is the normalized reproducing kernel for the Fox mix. So every time you have an A, you look at this, this translation modified by the uh, Jacobian, then what you get is an operator, which I denote by WA. Uh, it's going to be a unitary operator. It's very easy to check that this is, is uh, uh, it preserves the L2 integral with respect to a Gaussian measure. Uh, Ka uh, modulus squared is exactly the real Jacobian. Okay, so this is actually a uh, unitary operator on the Fox space, 
and they are called wild operators in the mathematical physics. Again, the, 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 this kind of operators uh, were, were studied many, many years ago. Uh, and it turns out they are very useful in the study of operators on the, uh, on the Fox space. Uh, a side remark over here, if you use the wild operator WA uh, coming from the uh, translation pod, and if you pair this together with a real T corresponding to a translation, then this actually gives you a unitary representation of the Heisenberg group uh, on the Fox space. Uh, every time you have a group, you sometimes you want to have like a unitary representation, meaning that you want a representation of the group uh, as a subgroup of the unitary group. And this is uh, it's a very famous, very classical uh, representation of the wild group uh, on the Fox space. Okay, so the way you use the wild operators to study our particular problem over here is this lemma, okay? Suppose you have a uh, linear uh, exponential function like this f and a g is its reciprocal. Then you can actually sit down and compute. Note that these two functions are definitely unbounded and it have exponential growth, uh, but the, operate, the, the functions are actually elements of the Fox space. So the corresponding topology of operators uh, although each individual operator is unbounded, uh, they are both uh, densely defined and you can check this product is also densely defined. And you can actually check that the product when you compute uh, becomes a certain constant depending on this A over here is a certain constant times the corresponding while operator WA. So you see that although the two individual operators are unbounded, the product over here is actually a constant times the unitary. In particular, this will be a bounded operator. Uh, the proof is not too difficult. You can just sit down and compute uh, using the uh, uh, explicit form for the reproducing kernel for the Fox space. You can sit down and compute TG bar. It's gonna be exactly uh, the uh, translation. And then if you want to uh, preserve uh, norm, then you just introduce the Jacobian back. And so you've, if you put a TF over here, then you get something like this. And after a minor adjustment, then this is exactly WA together with a constant, okay? So it's a, it's a very simple proof uh, if you know what you're doing uh, over here, okay? So one half, of the, one half of the theorem is already proved over here. In other words, if F is like this, G, and G is like this, and certainly you can have like constant multiples in front, then the product will be a bounded operator. Um, the sufficiency uh, proof over here actually tells you more. It tells you that uh, when this operator, this product is bounded, it is bounded in a very strong sense. When it's bounded, it's actually a constant time the unitary, okay? So in particular, we know that it is possible for this operator to be bounded, but it is not possible for this operator to be compact unless one of them is equal to zero because it's a constant time the unitary. There's no way you can get a compact operator uh, in that form, all right? Uh, another side remark out of this particular computation is that uh, if you take a function f like this and a g to be the reciprocal and at this time so it's a quadratic uh, exponential function uh, and then according to our earlier theorem this product is definitely going to be an unbounded function okay because we know exactly when this is bounded so these two functions will give you a unbounded operator but in this particular case we're going to actually compute the uh, uh, Burroughs and transform and the Burroughs transform after a very simple computation, it's gonna be just F times G bar. Since F and G, they are reciprocal to each other. If you take the modulus over here, the bar doesn't, ma doesn't matter and you're gonna get a one. So what we get over here is a unbounded operator with a bounded burst and simple. Uh, it's not something that it's uh, very significant, but this is an interesting example uh, for people who studied the Burroughs transform like 20 years ago. Uh, at one time, people were actually hopeful that the birth and transform may uh, completely uh, determine like when an operator is bounded or compact. But of course, after a very short period, people realized that that is not possible. There are many, many counterexamples 
uh, where an operator is unbounded, but the variance transform is bounded. So here is another very simple example of such a kind of example. Oh. <clears throat> All right, so that's a, a, uh, uh, the situation for Saros's original problem for the topless product uh, on the Hardy space, the Bergman space, and the Flux space. And again, to summarize, uh, on the two classical spaces, H2 and A2, the uh, conjecture was false, and on the Flux space, the conjecture is actually true. Now, uh, in the remaining part of the talk, I want to uh, uh, introduce two companion problems, very natural companions. Um, instead of looking at the topless product, you can look at, as I mentioned earlier, every time people study topless operators, they will also uh, study corresponding problems about the Hankel operators and, and the vice versa, okay? So the first uh, natural companion problem is uh, you, you can ask about uh, uh, products of Hankel operators. Uh, suppose, once again, in each of one of these three cases, you look at two uh, analytic functions, F and G, and you look at this particular uh, product. Again, the order of multiplication matters. And for Hankel operators, if the symbol function is analytic, you have to use, use uh, the conjugate of the symbol because an analytic symbol will introduce a zero Hankel operator. So the formulation over here is, again, you have to uh, take some care to have the right formulation. Well, that is the first companion problem. And another one will be, you can look at a mixed product, uh, a, a product of a Toblitz operator and a Hankel operator. And that is why the title of my talk today is uh, uh, Saracen's Hapless uh, product. You can talk about a product of Toblitz operators, product of Hankel operators, and also uh, products of uh, mixed uh, products. So I will I'll tell you uh, some recent pro progress on this two uh, companion problems. Uh, exactly when this will be bounded and exactly when this will be bounded. All right. uh, there are certain, there are several other uh, related problems you can uh, ask. For example, over here, uh, you may uh, look at a different uh, combination of the product. You may put the star like over here. There are some other similar problems you can ask. Uh, but so far, it, it looks like the most natural will be this two, and for this two, uh, we already have very satisfactory uh, answers. All right. Uh, uh, before I go even further, I want to mention that if you look at these two problems for the Hardy space and for the Bergman space, uh, the problems are still open. Okay. Uh, conjectures were already made in the 1990s for both of this, for the Hankel product and for the mixed product. Uh, there are already conjectures in the 1990s. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll show you what conjectures are, they're very natural. They're very similar to uh, Saracen's original conjecture. And in the 1990s, already one half for each one of these problems were already solved. And the other half uh, up to this day uh, are still open for these two cases. So my focus next will be on the Fox space where you can get more information. All right. And for the Fox space, uh, I want to mention that we almost have complete understanding. Uh, when I say almost, uh, for the mixed product, we completely understand the situation. And for the Hankel product, uh, we, we know the uh, Conjecture is, is false, but we don't have a full answer for the problem, okay? So I wanna uh, talk about the, the, the results uh, related to these two companion problems next. Now, if, of course, before you, you, you uh, go any further, you wanna make sure that the problems are non-trivial. Uh, it is very easy to see the problems are non-trivial for all the three cases, okay? It is very easy to find unbounded functions that the, such that the product will be Bounded. Uh, <clears throat> now, the Hankel product problem was already studied by Carol Strosov and De Chao Zing in the 1990s. Uh, in the case of, again, the Hardy space and the Bergman space, they formulated the conjecture, uh, they uh, proved one half of the conjecture, and then the other half, they had some partial positive results, but eventually they were unable to uh, come up with the uh, 
conclusion whether or not other direction is true or not. Or, or, or not. Okay. And the, now, first the conjecture. The conjecture is that for this particular Hankel product to be bounded on the Hardy space or the Bergen space, the Strauss-Hoff then conjecture was that this product of the two functions will be bounded. Again, the, the tilde over here means the, uh, the Bergen transform. And for people who study Hankel operators, this kind of uh, uh, structure is very natural, okay? Uh, so you remember earlier in, in, in Cyrus's original formulation, you do not have the minus part, you just have the first part. Um, for the Hankel operator, people already knew, uh, including myself in the 1990s, that the right uh, uh, formulation will be something like this. Uh, every time you study Hankel operators, you want to look at this difference. Uh, you can think of this as um, uh, conditional expectation or something like that. Um, uh, anyway, there, and also mean oscillation, right? There are many, many different interpretations for a difference like this. So uh, people who study this kind of problems knew that the right conjecture will be this, okay? And so Strauss often then proposed this conjecture for H2 and A2. And they also showed that uh, uh, in the case of the disk, and also I think in the case of the unit board, they showed that if this operator is bounded, then this function is indeed bounded. So they actually have one half of the uh, conjecture. And the later on, people also generalized this to bounded symmetric domains. And I think also to strongly pseudo-convex domains in higher dimensions. Um, and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as of now, the other direction is still open, although people think the conjecture should be true, but as, as of now, uh, there's no proof and there's no counterexample uh, for the other direction in the case of the Hardy space and the Bergen space. Uh, now, if you now think, in Saracen's original problem for the uh, Tobolis pro product, the problem for H2A2, the uh, conjecture was wrong. And then for the Fox base, the conjecture was true. And then when I started to look at this problem for the Fox base, the first instinct, of course, is to think maybe now the conjecture should be true for the Fox base. Uh, because again, for the Fox base, you have rigidity on the complex plane, you have uh, wire operators to use, and so on. Uh, so you have to think that the conjecture should be true for the Fox base. Um, but if you really sit down and look at the problem carefully, you realize that it's much more complicated than that. Uh, the first surprise is that um, uh, the earlier techniques for the Hardy space and Bergman space that do not work at all for the Fox base. Remember earlier, I already told you, Cyrus's original proof, one half page proof for, for H2A2 already uh, did not work for the Fox base. And the strauss of zinc proof for one half conjecture, for, for that uh, conjecture also does not work. And the, uh, first, the first surprise was that not only their proof does not work, actually the so-called easy direction actually is false for the Fox space, okay? So the uh, situation for the Fox space, uh, so I think I'm running a little late. I'm, I'm gonna go a little faster over here. Uh, I'll tell you what the surprise is, and the surprise came in 2018 uh, about uh, the Hankel product problem. Uh, the surprise was that, again, the Easy direction for H2 and A2 turns out to be false in this case. And uh, so in 2018, uh, together with De Chao Zing and two of his students, uh, so Ma Pan and Yan Fugang, the students of De Chao Zing, uh, we realized that their easy direction was actually false for the Fox space. And so the, the conjecture is definitely wrong for the Fox base but we were able to find much more information in this case. Uh, and also we've, we found out the difficult direction for H2 and A2, the direction that is still open, uh, is actually doable for the Fox base. So the situation over here is completely opposite. 
Uh, and to show you what we actually find out precisely, uh, this is the uh, one of the theorems. Okay, so uh, again, you take two entire functions from the Fox space. And you look at this uh, product of two functions in terms of the Burroughs and transform. And uh, the first thing we did was we figured out exactly when this function will be bounded. So forget about the operators first. Just look at this function. We were able to get a necessary and a sufficient condition for uh, exactly when this will be bounded. It turns out this function is bounded if and only if uh, f and a g will be of the following form. Uh, there's a trivial case. Uh, if one of f and g is constant, then the corresponding factor will be zero. For example, if f is constant, this will be zero. So that's the trivial part. Uh, if one of f and g is constant, this is of course gonna be bounded because it's identically zero. There is a uh, semi-trivial case. Uh, when both f and g are linear polynomials, a z plus b, a linear polynomial. If one of, if both of them are linear polynomials, then it turns out uh, each factor over here will be a constant. That's the semi-trivial case. And then the third case is the non-trivial case, when f is something like this and the g is something like this. And then you can actually sit down and compute, this is gonna be a bounded function and vice versa. If this is a bounded function, then uh, one of the three cases will occur. So that's our first result. We figured out exactly when this is gonna be a bounded function. And in each one of the cases, we can actually show that the corresponding Hankel operator will be bounded. Uh, in the trivial case, of course, the operator is zero. Uh, in the semi-trivial case, it was already known uh, for people who, who study Hankel operators on the Fox base. Every time you have a linear polynomial, then the conjugate symbol will in induce a bounded uh, operator. So in the semi in the semi trivial case, each individual operator is already bounded. And then the non trivial case, you have to do some work. You sit down, you can actually check that this product is bounded. So you see, in the case of the Fox space, uh, what they were unable to do for the Hardy space and the Bergman space, uh, we were able to build in this case. If this function is bounded, then this operator is bounded, because now we can check explicit, explicitly what happens. Um, all right, so the second result I wanna show you, again, that's a, a somewhat surprising, is the uh, other direction. Um, so for the Fox space, we know that if this function is bounded, then the operator is bounded. So naturally we wanna know what happens. Uh, if, what if the operator is bounded, can you show that this function is bounded? Remember earlier in the 1990s, they already showed that this is true for the uh, Hardy space and the Bergman space. Uh, when this product is bounded, then this function is bounded. And then we realized in 2009 that this direction is actually false in this case. For the Fox space, uh, there are examples when this operator is bounded, but this function is unbounded. Uh, we can actually construct a more extreme uh, example. There are actually non-zero functions in the Fox space such that this Hankel product is actually zero. When I say it's zero, it means that when you apply this to a dense, a certain dense set in F2, you actually get zero. Uh, we, we were actually able to uh, write down uh, examples like this. And therefore the bottom line for the Hankel product is that uh, the nitro conjecture is false. Uh, the earlier easy case turns out to be false in this case and the earlier hot case turns out to be easier over here. All right. Uh, next, I want to talk about this uh, mixed product. Uh, so you have a, a product of a toplet operator and a Hankel operator. And again, you can ask about when this is bounded on H2, A2, F2. Uh, again, uh, uh, the problem was already studied in the 1990s. Uh, the nitro conjecture, again, for people who know this kind of stuff, the nitro conjecture is this. Corresponding to the Hankel operator, you should look at this function and corresponding to the Toplitz operator, you should look at this function. And so the conjecture was that this mixed product is bounded if and only if this function is bounded. Um, 
For H2 and A2, I want to mention that the problem is still open. One direction is known. Namely, if the operator is bounded, then this is bounded, if the function is bounded. The other direction, there's no proof and there's no counter example. And then for the Fox base, again, the same group over here, uh, me and Dead Chow and his two students we were able to uh, uh, settle this problem completely for the Fox base. We realized, we proved that this is actually, the conjecture over here is actually true. And the theorem goes like this. Again, uh, we can do a little more. Not only we know uh, the conjecture is true, we know exactly when this is going to happen. Suppose, again, f and g are functions in the Fox space, uh, then the following conditions will be equivalent. Uh, the mixed product is bounded on the Fox space. This function is going to be a bounded function on the complex plane. And then, once again, we can do more. Uh, if this function is going to be bounded, it has to be constant. That's a very strong statement. And if, if you want this to happen, then one of the four situations over here will happen. There are two trivial cases. Uh, F is constant, which will tell you that the Hankel operator is, is zero, or G is identically zero. That will tell you the topless part is zero. Those are the two trivial cases. It's a semi-trivial case uh, when f is a linear polynomial and g is a non-zero constant. In that case, uh, each of the two operators will be bounded. So of course, the, pro the product will be bounded. So that's a uh, uh, semi-trivial case. And then the non-trivial case is when f is of this form and g is of this form. And in this case, the individual operators are unbounded, and then the product will be a bounded operator. So in this case, we were able to completely determine uh, exactly when this is true. And of course, the corresponding uh, conjecture is true. All right. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you do complex analysis on the plane, uh, there's the classical Duvier's theorem. Uh, that is sufficient when you study uh, Sarison's original problem for the Fox bits. But if, if you want to do this for the, uh, the Hankel product and the mixed product, then you need a vector version of Duvier's uh, theorem, which I state like this. Uh, so you take a Banach space and you take a function f from the complex complex plane to the Banach space, and they assume that this is the entire function uh, in the usual sense. Okay, and if this entire function is bounded in norm, uh, then it turns out the function will be constant. But of course, it's not a constant number; it's a constant vector. All right. uh, the proof of this is uh, it's based on the, the, the scalar version. It's, it's trivial. It's a half page proof. So, but I, I want to mention that you do need this vector version to uh, study the uh, Hankel product and the Toplitz product problems. And probably this will also be useful in other situations. So for people who study this kind of problems, maybe this is going to be a useful tool. Uh, all right, uh, once again, the proof is elementary, but it's uh, very useful in our study uh, that I mentioned. Okay, uh, I now want, want to summarize uh, the three uh, situations again. For the Fox base, we know that Saracen's original conjecture is true, and more information is known. We know exactly when this is true. And for the Fox, for the Hardy space and the Bergman space, uh, one direction is true and the other direction uh, is uh, the other direction is false, the counterexamples, remember. And now for the uh, Hankel product problem uh, for the Fox base, we know the conjecture is false. Okay. And for H2 and A2, uh, one, one half of the conjecture is true, the other half is still open. And for the uh, mixed product problem, for the Fox base, the conjecture is true, and we know more information. And for the Hardy space and the Bergman space, one direction is true, and the other direction is still open. So that's a, a summary of the situation uh, about the three kinds of products we uh, studied so far. Uh, generally speaking, I have to say that this kind of problems are a little easier for the Fox base, although 
when you say easy, it is the opposite. What used to be easy for the hardy space on the disk uh, becomes more difficult on the plane and vice versa. But generally speaking, the situation for the flux space is a little easier. Um, and I know that several other people have followed up uh, on our uh, research. Uh, instead of looking at operators on the standard flux space, you can also look at corresponding problems uh, for certain uh, weighted flux spaces. And I have already seen a few papers. Uh, so I know that there are still people working on this kind of problems. All right, okay, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Kehe. Let's thank your speaker. Wonderful talk. Is there any question? And if you have, please go ahead uh, because I do not see all. Okay, there is a question in the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I guess I need to stop sharing before I can see the chat. Yeah. Yeah, the, the problem makes sense for many other spaces. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, the Dirichlet space, you can still formulate the problem. But of course, the definition of the operators for the Dirichlet space, like uh, uh, if you look at more general symbols, the definition is already very complicated. But if you look at analytic symbols, uh, you just look at multiplication operators. You take a multiplier, you can look at the multiplication operator. And then the TF ball, you simply look at the adjoint of the multiplication operator. So the problem will definitely make sense for the duration of space and the many other uh, reproducing kernel uh, Hilbert spaces. Uh, but for myself, I have only looked at those uh, three cases. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Sir, can we get the slides of the talk? To what? Uh, can we get the slides of the talk? Oh, okay. the, sure, the slides. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, let, I, <laughs> I need to figure out how to do this. Uh, let's see. Okay, good. I, I think I can do it. Uh, you should be able to share it in the chat. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you see the file? Yes, thank you. All right, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, as well as survey. Is there any further questions or comments for Professor Zhu? If not, let's Thank Professor Zhu again. Thank you. Indeed.